And if you don't mind, while you're working on the audio, I'll just go ahead and talk a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Robert Knorr. I live in rural Pennsylvania. I've lived here my whole life. Uh, I ran for Congress in a special election. And one of the things I talked to you on the phone about, Dustin, was I felt that I'm some kind of big mouth that talked about politics all the time and how I feel the establishment kind of doesn't pay attention to regular people. So a bunch of my friends would constantly tell me, well, what are you doing about it? And they're right. I wasn't doing anything about it. So I decided one of the things I could do was run for Congress. And I got to learn a lot about the process and what was going on. And one of the things I wanted to tell even the Republican Party was there are people like me, regular people that are waiting in the wings that are going to do this, not because we want a job, but because we're concerned that the system doesn't care about us people in flyover country. We keep putting forth these people, but they're not really enacting anything. So that was kind of my motivation to begin with running. Okay. I think well, you might can, be there. Can you hear me now? Got you. Yep, got you. All right, hold on one second, because I figured out what happened, and now, where is the audio? Boom. Okay, can you hear me now still? Yep. There we gotcha. go. All right, well, folks, listen, I went on that long spiel, and I'm sorry about that. I don't think you heard it, because I just realized simple fix. My mic came unplugged. Good thing it happened at 5.30 in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. At least we're fixed. But anyway, I gave a nice long spiel, and I, and I got into you. But, yeah, it was interesting. I, I wanted you to just um, uh, talk to the audience a little bit about your background in debating, because that's kind of uh, some of the stuff I want to get into with you. Yeah, sure. So I was a collegiate debater. I grew up in a little town right outside it called Clayton. And I went to a university there. It's a state school, pretty much the cheapest school you could go to a university. And they had a debate program. And I got into it because the idea of being able to discuss any idea, it doesn't matter what you look like, who you are. Uh, I love that. You could debate anything you wanted. The problem was once you got into the activity, the higher up the ranks you went. And there's no divisions like college football or basketball. So I debate Harvard and Yale. Um, it was insane. It was the left of the left. So I started in 2003, I believe. And... The community was outrageous. You would have a topic that would be the same all year. So the topic might be U.S. federal government should reduce subsidies in one of the five, following five areas. You'd go in ready to talk about that, and instead someone would play a clip of Jimi Hendrix doing the national anthem and then simulate having sex with each other and not say a word. And when you said something effectively, like, what does this have to do with subsidies? You were called a bigot. Uh, you were routinely told if you were white or if you were a male or if you were Christian that you should be wiped out, that you were a terrible person. And I didn't mind that type of argument in the abstract because it's a game, but it literally became personal where they would talk about you personally and indict you as a person. So I saw a lot of what we're seeing in campus now 15 years ago because that community, everything I saw in the debate community, it was so far left. That's what we see now infiltrating our regular communities in university, and it's now infiltrating our public as well. Well, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting, and this is kind of where I want to go with this, is so I went to school for industrial design. I ended up uh, doing uh, c corporate uh, art and corporate design uh, in into my early 20s, ended up opening my own marketing company. And in 2006, I heard an old guy on local conservative talk radio, and he was talking about the mayor of New Haven, Connecticut, was going to be the first mayor in the nation to uh, give out ID cards to illegal aliens. And they were having a meeting at the VFW, and for some reason, I, I – I just decided to go, and I went down to the meeting, and within two weeks, I had taken this ragtag group of World War II veterans. I told them to get rid of the hard hats, get rid of the uh, blue-collared look thing you're going for because you look crazy, put on some suits, and let's go out there and fight these guys on their battlefield because we were fighting the politicians. And before you know it, I'm like in my 20s. I'm now ignoring my company. All of my clients are liberal. I'm in Connecticut, and they hate my guts. And I was not a debater. I wasn't even into politics, really. The next thing you know, and it was probably the itch of my dad being a cop and private investigator, all these old guys anoint me as the leader. I'm on the radio. I'm on TV. I'm in local news. And before you know it, I'm doing live debates. Back then, we weren't doing YouTube debates. We were doing live debates. And I'm up there with polished pol uh, politicians. And I ended up having to learn how to debate. And one of the things I saw right away, which a lot of people over the last two years are experiencing, and again, you said you saw it 15 years ago. I saw it back then around the same time. The first thing on the stage, they would open up. It was always given to them to open, and they would slam you with, that guy's a racist, that guy hates immigrants. And right off the bat, I'm like, 
what are you talking about? I, mm-hmm. My grandmother's from Japan. Now, before you know it, I spend 45 minutes in a debate in the first one defending myself, trying to disprove that I am or am not a racist. Mm-hmm. And it, it, and this is part of what, what you went through is very important, and it's unique uh, to all the other guests. This is what I want to talk about, is I want you to give the audience – Uh, some insight when you're debating even your uh, left-leaning family members or friends or people online, how do you overcome and deliver the facts? Because us uh, people on the right that are left-brain thinkers are going against people on the left who are right-brain thinkers. They're thinking uh, more emotionally. We're thinking uh, more, uh, you know, uh, utilizing statistics and facts. But how do you break through in those cases? The first thing is, Always be true to yourself. Don't worry about apologizing. Don't worry what they say, or even if you're in a room full of people that all agree with them, because oftentimes that would be the case with me. Everyone in the room, you'd have 30 people watching the debate, and you're the white guy. You must be racist. So I would routinely just say, I would stand up and be like, I'm not going to listen to this. I will literally walk out of the room. If you want to have a conversation about race, fine. I am not a racist, period. Never apologize. If you slip up and you say a joke or something, you know who you are in your heart. You're not a racist. So always remember that. That's the first step that you can take. You also have to remember, and this is true of any time you're having any type of debate, you have to know who your audience is. I always like to say that you have five potential people in the audience, and those are people that really agree with you no matter what or really disagree with you no matter what, then people that are on the fence agreeing with you or on the fence disagreeing, and then people in the middle that don't have an opinion or they just aren't informed at this point. So remember that your audience includes all of those people. When you're trying to reach this what they're saying when they're calling you a racist, you have to illustrate why you care about the groups that they're claiming. So for example, I'm told routinely, I'm a racist because I hate the war on poverty. I think that a lot of our welfare that we're giving out to the inner city is damaging to those communities because it makes them reliant on the government. Well, they tell me, well, you're a racist with money to black people. That's untrue. I actually care about the inner city. I think that we've seen a decline in what's going on in the inner city since the war on poverty. That's why I want to see the removal. So if we're taking the border specifically, one of the things that I like to focus on is I'm not just saying, oh, because I'm only concerned about the people that look like me. That's ridiculous. Some of the people I know that are the staunchest advocates for stopping illegal immigrants are legal immigrants who happen to be people of all different shades of religions of country of origin. So it's important to count your arguments in that term. Also, I could be able to say something like this. I actually care about the fact that a lot of uh, places say that up to one third of the women that are trying to come here illegally are sexually assaulted. The best thing we could do for that group is to send a signal to not even try to make the trip in the first place. So when you had the Democrats, for example, saying there is no crisis at the border, they were the ones who were ignoring those women. And so this is terrible to say, but that crew doesn't really care about people like me or you. They don't. So you have to be able to talk why these policies are good for people like me and you, but they're also good for the people that they are advocating for. And so when you start to do that, it gets you out of this trap of, well, you personally are racist. The other thing I'll say about this is there's a really clever trick. What the left tries to do is they're kind of they kind of try to control our vocabulary and the meaning of words. Even the left, if they're really sophisticated in debating, they have to acknowledge that you weren't born evil because they know if they say, well, you're white or you're in flyover country, therefore you're a terrible person. They have to say it's your choice to be racist or your choice to be terrible. So for example, get them to define something like whiteness if they critique your whiteness. What does that mean? And when I would do this in debate, you know, I would have someone that went to Harvard that got a full ride that's driving around in a Jaguar telling me that I have privilege and I'm because of my whiteness. And when you really get down to it, what is that privilege? It's basically money or power. So it's a difficult, uh, difficult sell for them to tell me that I have white privilege when I'm working at Burger King 40 hours a week to try to pay my way through college. I go to the cheapest school I could afford. I drive like a 1988 Ford Tempo with the muffler like tied on with a coat hanger and things like that. And then it really, their their power is their passion, the way they speak, where they make these accusatory statements to you. So if you just don't buy into it, if you're like, no, this is ridiculous, they lose all that power. Right, and the majority of the ones even out there telling you that you have white privilege are all old white people. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's the hilarious part about it. But so let me ask you, as someone who debates, because I know – 
uh, a lot of my friends in this community, you know, every, a lot of people doing stuff online. They're out there. They're activists. But they are always banging their head against the wall when they talk to their mom or their uncle or something. They can't wake up. Mm-hmm. Now, you just talked about you have to know your audience. So when you're debating on a stage uh, in competition or you're debating because you're running for office uh, or you're a comedian on stage delivering a performance, you adjust your performance based on the audience that you're performing for. And sometimes you go there thinking the audience is leaning right or leaning left, and you have to adjust on stage and debate just like you do in comedy as well. You might have 100 jokes, you're going to deliver 50, you take some out of your act once you realize the audience sways one way or the other. Now the question is, when the audience is only you and your crazy uncle, uh, at a certain point, um, do you give up and just say, okay, that's it, uncle is crazy, don't waste my time? Because some people are set in their ways, and it's going to be very difficult to open their eyes. That that's that's absolutely true. What I do in those instances is, I try to show that my actions are louder than my words. So let me give you an example. I I had all my friends in the debate community. The majority of them were left leaning, ranging from kind of moderate leftists to as extreme as you can imagine. But I became good friends with a lot of them, despite this. When Trump got elected, the first time I saw a lot of my old college friends was two weeks after the election. I actually uh, judged a debate tournament and they were at and they pulled me aside and almost had tears in their eyes telling me how racist I was (laughs) because I voted for Trump. Now, this was despite the fact that my best friend was a black guy that I lived with for three years, that I'd known these people for 10 years in the accusation of racism. Oh, wait, you're going to use that one? Oh, my black roommate. Right, right. (laughs) But they knew me for 10 years and it never came up once, right, that I was potentially a racist. And so, you know, all I could say to them, because in that moment, they're so irrational, is you know me, right? Like, we don't have to talk about this. I just want to show you who I am. And that's one of the things I wanted to say that with uh, Doug and American Joe that I'm very proud of and proud to be part of this is it's not just words. They're putting actions in it as well. And that's you saw this with the gentleman. I think he goes by the persistence on Twitter that was just in. I think it was San Francisco cleaning up the street with a bunch of conservatives. Scott, yeah. That's how you that's how you get inroads. It's you show we judge people by the content of their character. We are the party of Martin Luther King at this point. Mm-hmm. We ju- like when we're talking about environmentalism, for example, who are the people that you know that are the, do, actually physically doing the most for the environment? It's hunters. It's conservatives. Right. It's conservationists. And so. When you have those situations when you're with your crazy uncle, you just let them know, like, hey, I, that's cool. I respect where you're coming from. We don't have to talk about this. Show that you're a good person. And somewhere in their head, they'll be thinking at some point, like, how can I justify these two competing positions that this person, my nephew, is a crazy, insane racist, but at the same time, I see his actions, that he's a good person, and the way he carries himself in his life shows that it's good. But you're right. It's very difficult with some some people – you're not going to win that debate with changing their mind at right. that moment. All you could do is have a consistent argument and a consistent set of behaviors over a long period of time. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because I've lived in Los Angeles and I've lived in New York and there's so many people who are either from there and never really left or people that have been there so long in the acting business or something they don't really leave and they're the ones crying about uh, you know climate change and this and all this. I'm like, have you flew a plane from L.A. to New York and looked down – Uh, at all the green in middle America where those people are that you say are destroying America? Well, you live in New York with 14 million piled on top of each other with literal urine spraying out of the uh, sewer grates telling me that everything's polluted. You are the polluter, my friend. You are the polluter. Well, and the irony is what you see a lot coming from the left is there's this idea of moral superiority, and it bugs the crap out of me. I don't mind having a debate on facts with anyone, regardless of what your position is. The only thing I ask is for intellectual consistency. Don't be a hypocrite or have double standards. But this idea that they pretend to be more morally superior, basically what they're saying is this. We want the government by force of gun to take other people's goods and wealth and then distribute it to people we think deserves it more. That doesn't make you a moral person. We can discuss the factual nature of that. But what that makes you is a hypocrite because you're unwilling to give your own money. The same with environmentalism or even with the border. 
they'll tell us repeatedly, well, you have to, you're a bigot if you don't want these illegal immigrants. But where are they living? They're living in gated communities where they don't affect the, they don't see the right. effects of illegal immigration. And one of the things, again, when you're talking, you use their own logic against them. So we know for a fact that illegal immigrants coming and driving down jobs, the number one community that they compete with are inner city blacks because of the nature of having low skilled labor. And so the, it's it's constantly a hypocritical endeavor for them where you can just listen to them, listen to them talk, like watch Alyssa Milano's Twitter feed where she'll say, well, Trump wants illegals out. Who's going to clean our toilets? Yes, exactly. Now tell me who the moral person is again. You just want endangered servants. We actually want to treat people based on their character and we want to have a border. That doesn't mean we wish ill to the people, the good people that are trying to come here, but we have to be reasonable. Just like me and you, we might want to solve all the homeless people in the individual towns we live in, but we can't bring everyone into our house. There's better ways to go about it. So you want to couch it in the terms of, I'm not going to let you browbeat me that you're more moral than me. That's not true. I care about the exact same people you care about. The problem is they're focused on this kind of utopia and they're focused on them not taking personal responsibility. So they won't go out and clean the street themselves. They'll demand you clean it for them. And they think that makes them good people. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Now, Rob, one of the things that I think would be really interesting because I've been saying this for a while, one of, one of the places where I really disagreed with, uh, with president Trump is I believe that the moment he won, he should have, as the leader of the party, you are when you're the president, completely taken over the Republican National Committee, the RNC. He should have installed someone like a Dinesh D'Souza at the head of that organization who had spent the last 10 years framing arguments against the Democrats and turned the RNC into an America First uh, MAGA media empire. Uh, and someone like you, Rob, that comes in, uh, you know, like a Frank Luntz, but way better, and starts to put together these talking points in which we need to <coughs> provide to people who are going to run that are not just another squishy lawyer scumbag with an R next to their name to be able to frame these arguments. I think one of the places uh, that we need to start standing up to people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and you're talking about calling out their hypocrisy. Now, if you take these people who say they want to secure a $20 minimum wage, but yet that's for Americans, yet they want the border wide open. So they're bringing scab labor in who will work for $5 an hour, who the business owners usually abuse. They make them live in flop houses, uh, 40 uh, mattresses in the home. And we start to frame these arguments that on one hand, Elizabeth, you're calling for $20 minimum wage. On the other hand, you're calling for de facto amnesty, but that illegal isn't going to get $20 minimum wage. So you're not only bringing illegals in, you're putting Americans out of work. How, I mean, this stuff is easy to frame. We can refine this and put together the talking points for all the conservative candidates who want to challenge rhino Republicans. That I... I'm so happy you said this is something I wanted to talk about. I call it the immoral argument. And I was – I don't know why this argument isn't made more often, but I was talking about this a year and a half ago. I wrote a big thing up about this. So oftentimes if you just leave these leftists that want more government control talk, they'll contradict themselves within the very same paragraph. So they make two arguments for illegal immigration. The first argument they make is this moral argument that we have a duty to accept all these people. The second argument they make is an economic argument. They say, oh, illegal immigration is good for our country. Who would pick the fruit? The cost of produce would go through the roof, right? They make these two arguments simultaneously. What they don't realize is they contradict each other because the argument that you're moral for accepting them, but then you're saying, plus, they increase the value of my life because from the sweat of their brow, I could get cheap fruit. So in effect, what you're saying is I want people to come in and it's necessary for the economy to them to basically be endangered servants and slaves because that makes my life more profitable or my life more convenient. And so when you say this to them, this is how the debate plays out, because I've done it a million times. They'll right. say, oh, no, 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 no. We would like for those people to come in and also be making $20 an hour. Right. Right? That's exactly. what they say. And oh, then yeah, it's like, they'll say that oh. in the end, yeah. And then it says, and then the argument is, okay, well, then you've just destroyed the economy. Because right. your argument was, if we pay an American a fair wage to do this, the economy would collapse. That's why we need the cheap labor. And then right. I say, okay, so you're basically saying that our economy needs to subside off big. This is the same argument that slaveholders made, right? Yeah, exactly. And these are the people. These are the people that are telling you they're more moral than you. 
It was the same with Obamacare. It was the same type of argument. The two arguments were, one, morally, we have to give everyone this health care. And second, it will help us economically because right now everyone's using health care and not paying for it. Well, those two arguments are contradictory. Yeah. And uh, so this yeah, – go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, 100 percent. The other thing, too, is if you get minimum wage, everyone's at $20. $20 effectively becomes $7. Uh, if everyone's making it. If everyone gets a free bachelor degree, a bachelor degree is now the equivalent of a high school diploma. And that's what we're seeing now. Now, these are, these are other arguments. Look at the gun debate, for instance. Republicans generally get pulled into saying, well, it, it's the gun, I have a right to go hunting, or I, I have a right to defend my home. Now, as we all know, based on the Second Amendment, it's, it's primarily to defend yourself against your own government if that government turns tyrannical on you. Now, the argument I make to Democrats and leftists, which I've never seen a Republican on television ever make, is to say, one, it's to protect yourself against the government if it ever turns against you. Now, to the Democrats, let me explain this. You are calling Donald Trump Adolf Hitler. Now, if Donald Trump is really Adolf Hitler, and you think he's going to turn the intelligence community, the FBI, the military against you here at home, that would be what? A tyrannical government. Therefore, why do you not have a gun in your house to protect yourself from Adolf Hitler Trump? And I've never seen Republicans on television ever frame the argument that way, and I have done it personally in real life with Democrats who go, wait a second, I didn't even think of that. And I said, well, if you think he's Adolf Hitler, don't you want a gun to defend yourself? Frankly, you have a family and kids. You are irresponsible for not having a gun to defend yourself against Adolf Hitler Trump. And they also say that the police force are all racist murderers, right? So, again, what you're going to give only allow the police to have the gun, but they're all racists that are out to get me. Another argument with gun control is if you go back and you look at the history of when people started to first advocate against the Second Amendment in court cases, it was actually a direct response to the slaves being freed. And the argument was, we don't want these black people to have guns. Literally, that was the first argument. So one of the, again, it's about knowing your audience. And the sad thing is, I think people like me, me and you judge people by their character. So we don't care about these characteristics, but a lot of people on the left only care about certain populations. So if you can couch your arguments into why it's better for those populations, you could start to make inroads. So what we really, when we see then is gun control is a tool to be able to disarm black people in communities where violence is out of control. So the lawful blacks there, we're saying take their guns. Meanwhile, the latest statistics, I believe, are from 2013, show something to the effect of there was over 100,000 cases in 2013 where illegal, people that were not allowed to purchase a gun attempted to. Do you know how many the Obama administ administration prosecuted? Four. And so instead of prosecuting the actual criminals that are attempting to get these guns illegally, we're telling inner city blacks, hey, you live in a war zone, but you're not allowed to defend yourself. Oh, by the way, the Democrats say all the cops are racist and don't care about you. So you're on your own unarmed. That's the way Republicans, and like you said, the same type of argument. If Trump is this evil maniac, then why wouldn't you want to... The, Everything in life, you should always count about your personal responsibility and your personal freedoms. It's up to you before anyone else to do something. And so that's why it's important to have a personal right to self-defense. As soon as you're relying on other people, especially if you think they're corrupt, you're, you're in a bad spot. Right. And again, uh, before we jump to our next guest, uh, that's a good point I want to end on. Another argument to frame that Republicans should use, and Donald Trump did actually uh, use this during the campaign, and I was happy about it. But the fact is this. They say all cops are racist in these inner cities. The inner cities are run by white progressive slave masters uh, that are the mayor. You have a progressive slave master as a chief of police. The whole town council is generally black progressives. They make the laws. They tell the police what laws to enforce. Therefore, how are those police that they hire all racist, yet you're not mad at your mayor or your police chief or your town council. They hired them, they created the laws, and they tell them what to enforce, and they set the quotas. Again, Republicans should be firing back with this all the time, saying, how are you blaming me in middle America? I'm not the one setting the policies in Chicago. 
Right. And Republic, one of the problems with the Republicans that you can honestly say the Democrats are better at, the Democrats are good in going on the offensive. Democrats are always on the, or Republicans are always on the back foot, on the defensive. No, 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 we're not racist. No, no, no. Like, you need to be making arguments as to why the Democrats themselves and their positions are the exact things they're claiming. We see this with Trump. Every crime they accuse Trump of, they've done themselves. Everything they accuse you when they say, oh, you don't like this policy, you must be racist. They're the ones that are focused on race. So, you know, what I say is for these inner city population, you know, if I could give them one piece of advice, listen to Charles Barkley, the round mound of rebound. Uh, I don't necessarily think that he's the most intelligent guy in the world all the time, but he makes the point. I've heard him say several times. Why doesn't the black community just not vote Democrat for one election? Because the Democrats know they got the black vote. So they're like, uh, yeah, we don't have to do anything for that community. They're going to vote for us no matter what. We'll focus on illegal immigrants. If people, if people in the inner cities would wake up and say, we're going to stop voting for the exact same people, then maybe something would be done to improve their lives. So that's why I'm trying to, rec I'm trying to recommend to all the Republicans I'm in contact with, we need to be the party of we do not care about your sexual orientation. We don't care about your skin color. We don't care about your religion. We are the big tent party in that we care about the content of your character. That's it. And if we do that, I think we'll start to see a lot of improvement in these areas. That's great, Robin. We're going to start to put together some uh, private Zoom meetings with some of these streamers, some of the other people that are really active, start to bring on special guests for those Zooms and start to talk about strategy uh, long term and, and the technology we're doing and framing arguments and everything else. So this is fantastic. I know you said you can come back on. There was somebody who had a family emergency. If you want to come back at uh, 7 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, you're, you're welcome to do so. I would love to, and thank you so much. And I just wanted to say thank you to uh, everything you're doing, both exactly with the border, with what's going on there. That really needs to happen. And just the idea that you're bringing so many independent content creators. The best thing we could do for this country is to take the stranglehold of the mainstream media that control the narrative and give all sorts of diverse opinion to real Americans like you're doing. So thank you so much. And thank you. I'll uh, see you in a little while. Thanks. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, go to bordercommand.com. You can check out.